Okay, thanks for uh, waiting until the end, everyone. Um, my name is Stuart. I am the creator of Cities and Memory, um, which is one of the world's biggest sound projects and which I'll be introducing you to over the next little period of time, um, talking you through how the project works, some of the smaller projects that exist within it, um, talking a little bit about some of the connections the project has to Italy um, and how it can use sound to address bigger questions and wider issues. Um, so, first of all, I guess, what is uh, the project? So it's defined by this line, remixing the world one sound at a time. So what the project does is takes field recordings, takes the sounds of the world, and creates new compositions out of those recordings. So whether they're musical or abstract, um, they are brand new compositions built from field recordings and built from the sounds of the world. So everything comes under this, and the ambition of the project is to remix all the sounds in the entire world. Um, so that's quite a big ambition, but um, we're slowly getting there. Um, I come from a background of using sound in the context of music, so I've always been interested in remix culture and sample culture. I used to stay up late at night um, recording TV shows, recording films, recording sounds, and putting them back into music. And I've always been looking for a way to take all of these sounds and produce something bigger from them, and that's kind of what, um, what Cities of Memory is all about. So, as I mentioned, it's one of the largest sound projects in the world, so there are, at the moment, more than 5,000 sounds in the project. Um, it covers 113 countries, so that's more than half of the world. There are more than 2 million listens to the sounds in the project, and probably, most importantly, more than 1,000 artists around the world have taken part and I'll talk a little bit more about how openness is really important and really central to the project over the next few minutes. The project's also had quite a lot of media coverage, um, so as you can see, the likes of the New York Times and BBC and Reuters have uh, written about it over the last few years, and also um, Italian media coverage too, so the likes of La Stampa, Il Sole 24 Ore, and um, various other Italian media outlets have also written um, about the project over recent years. And at the center of the project is very obviously field recording, as you can see from these videos. Um, so to remix and to reimagine the sounds of the world, we first need to collect those sounds. So that's why recording is really central to the project. I make a lot of the recordings myself, as you can see from these videos. Um, and there's nothing more exciting to me than wandering around, for example, the streets of Rome earlier today and picking up some recordings of something I haven't heard before or something that's typical or something that really brings the city or a place to life. So it's really exciting to me to come across a sound I haven't heard before, to come across a sound that communicates something about a place and then to be able to, to capture it. But I'm also sent recordings from all over the world from both professional sound recordists, but also anyone who takes a recording with a mobile phone and just sends it into the project. So it's a real treat for me to open my email inbox in the morning, and sometimes there's a sound there from North Korea or from Bali or from Sao Paulo or something like that, and it's, it's just amazing to me to receive all of these contributions from around the world and be able to bring them into the project. So there have been many hundreds of contributions over the years, um, and we've built quite a few connections in the field recording community all over the world. But recording these sounds is only half of the project. It's then what do we do with those sounds and how do we use the sounds that gives the project its energy and its stimulus? So I really like this quote from Pauline Oliveros, which is from Deep Listening. So what is heard is changed by listening and changes the listener. And this kind of sums up what happens once we have a field recording, we take it, we reimagine it, and um, that can be anything from an electronic track or a piece of ambient music through to sound art, radio art, spoken word, poetry, so many different forms of, uh, of sound go into what we would call reimagining a sound. So I'll play you a few examples of those um, as we go through. We try to set as few rules as possible so the artists that are involved have the maximum liberty and the maximum ability to do interesting things with the sounds. So the only real rule is that you have to use the original field recording or some part of it somehow in the composition. Otherwise, it's pretty open. Um, 
so what does reimagining a sound actually sound like? Um, I've got two examples to play you from Rome. So first of all, you'll hear a sample of a field recording, this one very obviously from inside the Pantheon. And then second, you'll hear a reimagined version of that sound. So for this composition here, um, it was about imagining that there might be birds living in the roof of the Pantheon, kind of flying down through that hole in the roof, swirling around up at the top and living in there amongst the humans. So that's uh, where this piece comes from. This is the reimagined version. That gives you some idea as of what we mean by reimagining a sound. Um, there's a second example, which is from the Sistine Chapel. Now, to me as a tourist, coming to the Sistine Chapel was an incredible experience to look at this incredible space. But what I found really interesting um, was the sound of the Sistine Chapel, which not many people talk about. So the sound of the Sistine Chapel is um, people, a man every so often will say, silencio, silence. No video, no photo, silence and then the room will be silent. Someone over here will start whispering. Someone over here might start talking quietly. After three or four minutes, everyone's just talking. The entire space is just full of noise and conversation, and then you hear this silencio again. So you hear the recording of that happening, and then you'll hear the reimagined version, which is me attempting to recreate my experience of the sound of the Sistine Chapel, doing that through a composition. So that's what we mean by reimagining a sound, and we always present the sounds in the project in pairs, so always the field recording and the composition. So to me, um, you know, we come back, everyone who talks about sound art talks about John Cage, as we had in the previous presentation as well, but this, um, this statement from John Cage is just wonderful to me. It's really a, at the center of cities and memory, which is about sounds demanding an emotional response. So when you hear something, in a recording, in a sound, something standing out to you emotionally and making you want to respond to it in an artistic context, in a composition. That's really important to the project. And the other thing that's important to the project is that it's open, which is to say that anybody in the world can take part, either on the composition side or on the recording side. It doesn't have to be 
a professional recording artist, it can be a mobile phone recording. It doesn't need to be um, you know, someone signed to a record label, it can be anyone, bedroom producer, and we're interested in any bedroom producer in the world. Um, and to me, the, the joy of doing something like this online through the internet, the joy of the internet is that this probably wouldn't even have been possible 10 years ago. The technology is democratized, recording equipment is cheap, musical equipment is cheap, we can connect through social media, and we can build this brilliant connection um, of, of sounds and of artists around the world. So to me, to be able to connect a sound artist from Rome with a field recordist who's in Sao Paulo over a recording of New York, all from a project that's based in Oxford, is something that just um, makes me smile every time I think about it. And that's kind of what the project's all about. And it's about also this emotional response and this sort of shared experience and, and the diverse memories. So being able to share that emotional resonance, uh, resonance both between artists, but also between the artist and the listener. So that's a really important way of sharing the sounds of the world. And where, we, where I'd really like to take that is that, first of all, I want to encourage people to listen to the world and really listen to it and take their headphones off and come out of the bubble and listen to the surroundings that are around them, but then also to start to listen to the world differently. And that's also kind of at the center of the project. So once we've collected the sounds and then recomposed them and reimagined them, then how do we present them? So I'm also a bit of a map nerd. I'm really interested in maps. Uh, I love the idea that there's no such thing as a neutral map, a politically neutral map, a culturally neutral map. It's impossible. And all of those subtexts and contexts of mapping are what really makes it interesting to me. And with all of these sounds recorded in particular places, it means that a map is a very obvious place for those sounds to live in. So we created a global sound map to house these 5,000 sounds which looks like this. This is the website homepage, and this is what happens when you use the sound map and zoom into one of those sounds we were just listening to in Rome. So you zoom into the city. You can see there's quite a few sounds in Rome already. We're just over there. And then you hear that sound we were just listening to. So that's the sound map as it exists at the moment, but the project also exists in several other forms. So there's a podcast, so that's out on Spotify and Apple Music and all those places you would normally get podcasts with thousands of subscribers on there. The British Library archives the project automatically, so um, sounds that are added to cities in memory are automatically added into the digital archive of the British Library, which is obviously huge for us. It's really nice for them to be able to take the sounds that we're recording and preserve them for posterity, and it's really great for the artists that contribute to also know that their compositions and their sounds will be used by the British Library uh, and, and, you know, and preserved. So preservation is a really important part of it. It also operates as installations. So this is an installation we did in Oxford using these wonderful devices called memory phones where you can put your head right inside the memory phone and it will play you recordings of the city of Oxford, which was uh, just a great experience to see these dotted around the city um, playing my sounds. Um, and it can also work as live performances. So this is a small clip from a live performance um, in Portugal last year. So those are the various forms of the project, um, and it always excites me the project can go in lots of, lots of different directions. It always makes a huge impression to me when I hear of um, someone teaching the project in an academic class or of a student that's referred to it in a paper. I mean, those things really excite me. I love to receive those emails and to hear that the project is being used in these ways. And one of the other things that we do, we've run so far 28 different sound projects, each exploring a different area of sound and we'll talk through just a couple of those as we go through the presentation. Um, the project also has some quite strong connections with Italy, um, which I will briefly talk about. The name of the project, Cities in Memory, comes from Invisible Cities by Calvino, um, partially because, to me, the, the idea within that book of Marco Polo talking to Kublai Khan about all of these different cities, these fictional cities from around the world, but to really be talking about Venice every single time talks to me about how my experience of a city is different from your experience of a city, and uh, everyone's experience is completely individualized, and it's exactly the same with how we experience sound. It's a very different emotional resonance that you might get from a field recording or a, a sound of a particular place that, than that I might get. The logo of the project is also um, a street map from Venice as well. 
Um, my partner is also Italian, um, so it means I've spent over the last few years quite a lot of time in Italy. So as you can see on the sound map, um, there's an awful lot of Italian sounds on there, particularly up in the northeast there. So it's been nice for me to hear the sounds of Italy myself, record them and add them to the map. And we've also done a specific project uh, in Rome. So what I, quite, I find exciting is the idea that I can give one field recording to 50 different artists and I will get 50 completely different versions back. 50 different compositions will come back from one recording. So I tried that out with this recording. I had a recording that was particularly kind of important to me. Um, I thought it was a very nice field recording from the Giardino degli Aranci, um, which had jet fighters rehearsing for Due Junior. It had um, a busker, it had a fountain, it had the usual kind of tourists and all of that kind of stuff in there. Really rich recording with loads of different ways into it. I sent that recording out to 50 different artists and I got 50 completely different compositions back. So this is just going to be a clip of four of the different compositions so you can get an idea of the different types of creativity that come from just one recording. So just within that short clip, you can hear an orchestral approach, a full electronic track, uh, a piece of kind of radio art, spoken word kind of stuff, and a, and a more abstract kind of cut up, all coming from the same recording. Um, and I find that a, a really fascinating part of the project. Um, when setting it up, I set the project up with several principles at its heart. Um, the first one is, is this idea of openness, which is really important to me, which is that sometimes I think sound art and the sound world can feel a little bit closed. It can feel a little bit like it sometimes maybe excludes people or people don't know how to find a way into it. And so to me to have this project to be completely open for anyone that wants to take part in it, anyone that, that, that wants to kind of get involved and for it to be a doorway potentially to get into the world of sound is hugely important to me. And having that openness is what I think find, I f makes it interesting. Along with openness is this idea of possibility, that whole idea, going back to John Cage, that all sound can possibly be music, all sound can possibly be art. And when you open yourself up to that possibility that any sound you might be listening to could be art, then there are so many possibilities in different directions and ways that, that you can go with that. And that means that it's inclusive, so all approaches are valid um, and equally valid. So where that takes us is this idea of creating a new form of listening. So taking the headphones off, listening to the world, and starting to listen to the world differently. And once we start to listen to the world differently, then we can start to use sound to ask a whole bunch of interesting questions about the world we live in and see what role sound could have in answering some of those questions. So if you take a recording of the world on its own, you're presenting the sounds of the world. But if you take those reimagined sounds, those compositions, then that allows you to use those sounds to ask some of these interesting questions. So I'm going to put a few questions up on the screen. I'm going to show you how potentially one or two of the projects that Cities and Memory has run and hosted um, go some way to answering some of those questions. So for example, what does sound tell us about the places that we're living in? It could tell us an awful lot about the cities that we live in. It could tell us about the character of a place. It can tell us about the health of a place. It can tell us what makes a place unique. And it can tell us how a place is changing and also how quickly that place is changing. Quite often, sound is almost like a canary in, in a coal mine where you hear the sound changing before you see other bigger changes happening in the city. So sometimes sound can be an advance warning of the changes that are coming to a place, if only we're actually listening and, and paying attention. And sight versus sound is a very interesting one about our experience of a city. If I ask the average person what Rome looks like, they'll probably say, well, it looks like the Colosseum, or it looks like the Forum, or something like that. 
if I ask someone what Rome sounds like, you might have something much more everyday and much closer to the way in which we live our lives. Like, it could be the sound of the metro, it could be the sound of the, uh, the wheels going across those kind of cobbled streets. It could be, you know, the, the, the sounds, when you think of a city, tend to be closer and less kind of iconic and touristy, if you will. So sounds very close to us for that. And there's no question that, you know, sound, um, cities are, as this quote from Rem Koolhaas says, they are starting to become more and more the same. Now here, he's talking about architecture. He's talking about the way a city looks. But it's equally true of the way that a city sounds. If you were going to try and design something to make a place sound bad, then you'd probably design a city the way it is now because they're full of tall buildings made of hard surfaces with long flat sides going along huge distances. And what that does is just transmits low frequency sound waves over huge distances. So the sounds of cars and the drone that you get of traffic traveling huge distances is basically partially a byproduct of the modern city. Um, and so we're almost creating places to sound bad as opposed to creating places to sound good or to sound interesting or to sound like they have character. And I think that's something that sound really tells us about a place that's very, very interesting. Um, sound's also got a huge role to play in expressing the character of a city. So when you lose a soundscape, when you lose a sound from a city, it's gone forever. And it's very, very hard to get the way a place sounds back. And if that was happening to the way a city looked, we wouldn't stand for it. If someone went and knocked down an incredible, iconic building that we love looking at every day, we would be complaining. But when a sound disappears from a city, we barely even notice, and we certainly don't protest about it. So we're not doing anything to identify the sounds that are culturally important, and then doing anything to protect those sounds. So this also allows us to think about what does it actually mean for a sound to be significant? How can a sound be important? How can a sound help us to characterize a place? So sounds are changing now at a faster rate than they've ever changed since probably the Industrial Revolution. Um, so there are sounds now, if you think about, I'm not even talking about modems or floppy disks. I'm talking about potentially a ringtone or something like that, which could only have come from three years ago. So there are sounds now that sound old and out of date, even though they're two, three years old. So sounds are changing super, super quickly now, and it's really hard for us to, you know, to even keep pace with that, let alone address it. And to me, I think the next interesting change that's going to come in the sounds of our cities is going to be around cars, because the internal combustion engine is on the way out, and electric cars are on their way in, which is great, because it means the sounds of engines is going to drop down, and we're going to be able to hear the sounds of nature maybe more, or some of these culturally significant sounds more. But it also means that a lot of how we experience our lives is going to be in the hands of a very, very small number of sound designers. So the people that are designing the sounds for electric cars, so the guy that's designing the sound for Tesla over here or Mercedes over here, are going to have a huge bearing on our daily lives and how we experience them, because that's going to be the sound of cities from now on. It's going to be the sound of electric cars. And I'm not sure we're really thinking about what that means um, or where it's going to go. So that's really interesting to me to think about that one. But to come back to those kind of culturally significant sounds, I guess you could say what UNESCO might call intangible heritage is really interesting. So the sounds of flamenco in Seville, for example. Musical heritage, like now our music in West Africa and Morocco. The sounds of traditional crafts, the sounds of traditional manufacturing, or even natural sounds in human spaces are all significant. And also, to me, often, it's the sounds of religion that are among the most significant culturally which is why we ran a project um, a few years ago called Sacred Spaces, which was all about the sounds of religious spaces. So an organization in the UK called the Churches Conservation Trust came to me and asked me to record some of their churches that are no longer used. Some of these churches date back to the 1200s. I know you've got older churches than that here, but that's pretty old for us. Um, so I was kind of going around ringing the bells and recording all these sounds of churches, which was great fun, but I just, I, I thought, this needs to extend to all religions. This needs to extend to as many recordings as we can get from all over the world, from lots of different religions. So we did that, and we created this project which gathers together the sounds of prayer and religion from different countries and from all over the world. And that, as well as being extraordinarily beautiful, tells us a lot of things about how these sounds are used. It tells us that religious sounds 
almost no matter what the religion are used for things like helping us to mark out the day, so telling us when to get up, when to go to bed, when to go to prayer, all of these kinds of things. But also, they're very specific. So if you think about the way church bells sound in one village compared to the next village, you know, you would never mistake your own church bell for the one in the next town across, because they sound basically like a fingerprint or the back of your hand. They sound unique. So there's this idea that the sounds can be used in similar ways, but they're also highly specific to individual places. So what you get is some examples like this. So these are the bells of Saint Severin in Paris ringing for mass. This is a call to prayer from Jerusalem. And these are some Hare Krishna singers I recorded in Cardiff in Wales. So the project also tells us a bit about how some of these sounds are in danger too. If you think about bells, they used to be the loudest sound anyone would hear outside the context of a war or going into a blacksmith's. That would be the loudest sound you would ever hear would be a bell. And now they're just getting drowned out by the sound of cars. So this also has a kind of preservation um, element to it in, in this project too. Um, so related to that is, you know, what can sound tell us about how we live and act? So some of these religious sounds will help to, um, you know, to get that across because that's also about how we live and act. But to me, the project that we've done that achieves this the most successfully was called Protest and Politics. So that was a project we did in 2017, which was the first mapping of the sounds of protest, political unrest, social unrest in the world. And it was a very good time or bad time to be doing that project because it was the time of protests against Brexit. So I went on a protest against Brexit um, because I firmly believe that that's been a disaster for the UK and I think that's probably even proved right, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, protests against Trump across the USA, various protests across Latin America and, uh, and across Asia. So huge amounts of protests happening at that time. We collected them, we recorded them, and again, we sent them out to artists to, to reimagine and, and give new context to them. So. This is a very brief introduction to protest and politics. So what I learned from this project is that every protest is characterized by emotion, and they all have a different emotion. Some protests are angry, some of them are sad, some of them are celebratory, some of them offer just hope. Um, so the level of emotion in this project was, was huge and hugely important. And the way also that sound transports you to being in that protest, we all get very used to watching protests on TV with the sound off, just pictures, no sound. As soon as you hear the sound, you're there, you're in the protest. Um, and it, it taught me about the differences and similarities with protests. So, you know, you'll hear across Latin America the um, panelao, which is the pot banging protest where everyone goes into the kitchen and comes out with pans and starts banging them. Or across the USA, similar, exactly the same chants against Donald Trump happening all over the country because they were spreading through social media. So lots of similar and, and different ways that people are using protests. So it's a really interesting snapshot of that point in the world. So related to protests, then how does sound help us to tell our stories? So clearly protest and politics does that to some extent, but uh, I think probably the project that, that does it the best in terms of archiving some of our social and political history was a project called Stay Home Sounds, which is 
done during the COVID-19 lockdowns. So this is the biggest collection in the world of the sounds of what life was like in lockdown during COVID-19 all over the world. So this is what kept me going through the lockdown was setting up this project and again, each morning opening my inbox and having not just the sounds being sent to me from all over the world, but also the stories that went along with that. So hearing what people were going through, hearing how they were experiencing life, what the conditions of lockdown were like in various different countries around the world was something that was just an extraordinary privilege to be able to listen to um, and to be able to, to present during the course of the pandemic. And I think from a sonic point of view, there were four categories of sound that you could probably pick up through the course of the pandemic and probably be familiar to everyone here. So the first is brand new sounds that we'd never heard before. So for example, this is health workers coming out at six o'clock every evening in Paris to just applaud, um, sorry, people coming out to applaud health workers every night um, in Paris. The second category is how famous places that are normally very, very busy and very, very full sounded when there was no one in them at all. So this is the sound of Times Square in New York during the pandemic, which is normally obviously one of the busiest places in the USA, maybe one of the busiest places in the world. In the lockdown, all you can hear is air conditioning, nothing else but air conditioning. And then nature was coming to the fore during the pandemic. So you would hear types of bird or types of animal um, that you would never normally hear in an urban setting before. The animals started to come back into the city, which was, um, which was incredible. So this is the sound of a scops owl um, in Thessaloniki in Greece, which had not been heard in that city for many, many years. During the pandemic, it became so quiet, the owl started to come back into the city and, and live there again. And then the fourth category is the things that people did during lockdown when they were going crazy uh, to try and keep themselves sane, whether it was, I don't know, playing music or learning new games or taking up a new hobby. This is a sound from California where an entire neighborhood would just every single night go out and howl like wolves because they were so bored. especially that guy at the end. Um, and along with all of these sounds, we asked people to write their stories. So you know, the, there were so many amazing stories um, that, that came through the project, and, and that's why, to me, this is one of the projects that I kind of hold closest to my heart, because it, it really tells the story of what life was like for all of us during that pandemic. Um, and so I just thought I'd share some sounds from Rome with you guys to kind of take our minds back to that. So there's three short recordings here from Rome. Um, the first one is from people obviously going out onto the balconies to, to meet with their neighbors every evening to listen or to sing songs. In this particular extract, they discovered that one of their neighbors is a talented flute player. So about this time of year, just before 25 Aprile, um, they came out and played Bella Ciao um, to celebrate with everyone. The second clip is people going out onto their balconies and singing every night. Um, at the same time as the church bells were ringing at 6 o'clock, everyone came out and sang a different popular song uh, every evening. And then the third is the sound of the kind of, I guess, one of the office districts. But it's no longer the sound of a big city. It's the sound of a very, very small town, a very, very quiet town, but it's still Rome. So here are those three clips.
it was very nice going back through that project to put this presentation together for today. It was really uh, kind of re-experiencing some of those emotions, so it was very nice for me too. Um, so as well as helping to tell our own stories, sound can also help us to tell stories about the world around us um, and in a way that is potentially more arresting and more interesting than, than mere words or, or mere data. So we ran a project um, around climate change um, called Polar Sounds. So two scientific institutes uh, in Germany um, over a period of months and years collected the sounds of the Arctic and the Antarctic. So the sounds of seals and whales and cracking ice human activity, all kinds of things. Um, and they've done that over a period of months with passive microphones. So you leave the microphone there for months, and then you go through an enormous amount of data, and you come out with these amazing sound recordings. They wanted that data to reach beyond the scientific community, beyond the world of research papers and science, and to a much wider audience. So they came to us, to me, to work out how we could do that through Cities of Memory. So we put together a project called Polar Sounds, where uh, we wanted to bring attention to how rapidly the Arctic and the Antarctic are changing through the effects of climate change, and we wanted to use sound to do that in order to encourage listeners to help think about the poles and think about how we can preserve them for future generations. So this is just um, an example of um, a recording from Polar Sounds. So the, the recording you'll hear in this is it's a composition. It's built around the song of a humpback whale. Um, and the humpback whale song is used so musically and so perfectly in the composition that it fits like another instrument just over the top. So that was the Polar Sounds uh, project, and two things really struck me about the way that the recordings were used. Um, the, the first is how often the sounds were just left completely untouched by artists. Normally, you'd expect them to maybe add some reverb or some delay or to put, some, put them through some effects or chop them up. A lot of the time, they just kept the recording completely and just added it into the composition because a lot of these sounds were so extraordinary, so amazing, or so musical. Um, some of them just sounded like synth lines, so you just pop them straight into a track. It was amazing. Um, and the second was how emotional some of the responses were. This is effectively scientific data, and you're sending it out to artists, and they're really finding the emotional core of what lies behind this, what the data means, and what, that kind of, and what they want to portray through the, the composition they make from it. So I've got two more questions to address, and then we can all go and have dinner. Um, so Cities and Memory can also look at how can sound give us a new perspective on other forms of art. Um, so there's several projects where we've actually come away from the map, we've come away from the real world, and we've kind of interfaced with various different media, various different forms of art. So for example, uh, we did a project called Dada Sounds to celebrate 100 years of the Dada movement. And in that, we asked artists to apply the techniques of Dadaism to a field recording. So whether that was a sound poem, or a cut up, or a collage, or an abstraction, that was basically providing artists with the creative tools that they needed to remix a sound, but doing it through an art movement that happened 100 years previously when you couldn't have worked with any field recordings of sound. So that was a really interesting one for, to kind of bring those two things together and see what the results were. Second one, um, the world of literature. So um, we created a project um, for the 700th anniversary of Dante's death um, called Inferno. 
which was asking artists to imagine the sounds of the inferno. Um, so what we did was took this famous map from one of the editions of the inferno, uh, divided it up into the different zones, the different areas of hell, allocated them out to artists, and asked them to just develop a completely free composition based on what they thought the sound of, for example, Earth Center or Satan or the hypocrites um, would, would sound like. And again, a really amazing range of, of different responses and different ideas of what hell might sound like. Um, and off the back of this project, we also produced a soundtrack for the 1911 silent film Inferno, which we've run a few screenings of as well, which also worked really, really well. So that's Inferno. And then there's also sound photography, which is one of my, uh, one of my favorite projects personally, which was where we asked um, artists to respond not to a piece of sound, but to a photograph. So we put a gallery of photographs together. We provided no other information than the location. So it was all about how the artist would just respond emotionally to what was in the image. Um, so how did it make them feel? What did they kind of, what's the story that they imagined coming out of the photograph? And, and how did they tra then translate that into sound? So this is one very short snippet from the project, which is this photograph, um, which the artist Rob Knight has reimagined. He felt that this photograph represented brief moments in time. So he took different spans of time and weaved them in and out of one another. And he also wanted these sounds to be warm to reflect the way that the light was in the photograph. But you know, if you look at this photograph now, what are the sounds that, that come into your head as, as you listen to this piece being played? And then I guess lastly is this comes back to the whole idea of cities and memory, the memory part of cities and memory, which is how can and how do sound and memory interact? You know, we can all hear sound before we're born. Um, it, it's the first sense that we become aware of. Um, and it's a sense that remains incredibly close to who we are as people, but it's still quite underrepresented um, and, and quite overlooked, particularly in today's visual culture and, you know, social media and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so sound is really important to us, sometimes quite overlooked, but really, really important for memory. I think along with smell, it's probably the sound that could transport you into a place immediately. You hear a sound you hadn't heard for years, and you're right there. You're in that place, and lots of kind of emotions and feelings can come up. So one project we did last year to work around this was called Obsolete Sounds. So this was a huge collection of the obsolete and disappearing sounds of the world. So some of those might be the sounds of like a, a modem or an old Game Boy or uh, an old mobile phone, something like that. So the sounds of technology. But equally, some of them were the sounds of Cambodian folk songs or the sounds of the hand tea making process in the Azores or the sounds of some cracking glacier ice in, in Norway. So lots of different ideas and concepts of what an obsolete or disappearing sound might be. But so many of the responses came back to people's childhood, came back to people's memories as they were growing up, and came back to bringing those memories and translating them into the compositions at the other end. So two quick examples. The first, this is the sound of an old Super 8 film projector. So for the remix of this, the, the artist in question, this took him back to his parents' living room in, in 1978, where they always had a Super 8 projector in the corner projecting films onto the wall. They always had an old battered piano in the same room, which um, you know, his mum would always play on. And so this really transported him to his living room. And so he put this piece together, which is based around the piano, which is how he interpreted the Super 8 camera. And the second, um, this very obviously is the sound of an Olivetti typewriter. And the response to this had loads of different layers. So um, the, the person in question, their grandmother, 
gave them a typewriter very similar to the one in the recording um, when she was growing up and she has gone on to become an artist and a writer and uses that typewriter in her response. But her grandmother was also a poet. So her grandmother wrote a poem called Web of Life, age 93. She took an audio recording of her reading out this poem, Web of Life, age 93, and she put it back into the composition. So in her response to just the sound of a typewriter, you can hear the recordings of the original typewriter the recordings of the actual typewriter that her grandmother gave to her, and also a recording of her grandmother, who has now passed away, reading out one of her own poems. So it's just this really amazingly emotional response to a piece of machinery, effectively. So that, um, I hope, introduces uh, you guys to Cities in Memory and what the project is all about and this kind of idea of it being set up to help us listen to the world differently. And if we think about how we listen to the world, if we listen to the sounds around us and listen to them differently, then sound can potentially help us to frame issues like politics, to think about how we tell our own stories, to present issues like climate change, or to consider how, sound, how memory can, you know, can work together with sound so we can kind of do greater things um, with sound. So it's a really open project. Um, so if anyone obviously wants to take part with a, a recording or a composition, then please do get in touch. But um, I hope that was interesting. Um, and that was Cities in Memory. So thank you for listening. <laughs>